Chapter 1 The Past, Hatred, Death and Curse. Goryeo. Kim Tech sat at the table with a bowl overflowing with rice alcohol. He drank one gulp after another without stopping to look at his surroundings. In his head only one thought, Yang Di, in his heart only pieces of his first and great love. Pain. He could not understand what was happening to him. He, poor ignorant man, had believed every word of that perfidious serpent in the body of a goddess. The son of a minister of the king, adored and desired by the highborn ladies and all the others, the favorite among the Kisang, had been deceived by an innocent young woman who only wanted to get his seed in order to marry a man incapable of procreation. Had he loved her? Nor was he able to know with certainty the feelings that overwhelmed his body and soul, though he now recognized one above all others, hatred, jealousy, despair. He brushed his hair with an unusual force for the listlessness that encompassed his entire body. He picked up the bowl in front of him, filled with the white liquid that held the promise of anesthetizing his body and mind, and gulped it down. The white, naked body of that little which popped into his mind, every soft curve, every sweet inch of skin, and he felt himself tearing up inside as he imagined how he would be defiled by that wrinkled old man. At another time he would have been aroused, but the alcohol had slowed his blood and his spirits. He clenched his fists tightly and rubbed his eyes, trying to keep the tears burning his eyelids from spilling over. How could he cry for a woman, he hated it when tears caught in his throat. I need more alcohol, here. He shouted without looking up from his clenched fist, watching helplessly as his knuckles turned white. Yes, my lord, at once, replied a female voice. Kim Tech, the firstborn son of the Kim household, was feeling the pain of being betrayed by a woman for the first time, that cat eye which had seduced him into being little more than a lapdog, and now she unceremoniously discarded him, and the only excuse she gave was that her family wanted her to marry her uncle to continue the pure bloodline. And he, after having known the sweetness of passion, found himself separated by a man three times his age, and could only console himself with the thought that perhaps the old man would die soon and he could take his place, or his beloved, knowing that their conjugal life would be sad and scarce, would grant him the honor of occupying her bed some dark night, hidden from the world. Neither option was to his liking, and for that he hated it and hated himself even more. With distaste he remembered, much to his regret, the smoothness of her skin, her full, soft lips, pink like the petals of flowers in spring, her long, slender legs, which he wrapped around his waist as he slipped inside her, feeling at one with the world for the first time in his life. He had given himself body and soul to her, he had wanted her so much that his reason was clouded. And because of that damned weakness he now kept himself submerged in these terrible thoughts in front of the alcohol that had allied itself with his bad luck and was not granting the promised oblivion, on the contrary, with each new drink new memories of that intimacy that now seemed an impossible dream appeared. He took another drink and felt the liquid burn in his throat. Hatred flashed like a flame, burning him whole. He could not consent. He would not stand by and watch his sweet beloved suffer a marriage that would lock her into a suffering worse than death. He would save her and thus take the place of husband and protector, she would be grateful, and both of them, together with the child they were expecting, would have a happy life. Yes, I would do that. He stood up and staggered, so with the same enthusiasm he sat down again. He slammed his fist on the table in fury. I won't have it. He said to no one in particular. He poured himself another drink and drank it without taking a breath. Shut up. You're giving me a headache, shouted another man sitting at the opposite table. Kim Tech stared at him, but the vision shifted, so he blinked to try to focus his eyes. Ji Sub stood with his head resting on his fists, staring passionately at the empty bowl of alcohol in front of him. He blinked vehemently, watching the bowl sway and shake on the table. He rubbed his eyes. I'm seeing double, this alcohol must not be of quality, he remarked to no one in particular. Kim Tech watched as his childhood friend, now an enemy since the two families were at loggerheads, drank and rubbed his face with the same desperation as himself. If I bother you, go away. You look like a baby crying your sorrows. You'd better go home and let your poor father beat you up so you'll behave like a man. Kim Tech stood up again, this time holding onto the table so as not to lose his balance. What did you know of manhood, you're nothing but the second best in your family, a disgrace to hide. 
Ji Sub looked up and tried to fix his gaze on the double man in front of him. You seem to want me to beat you up myself, but you'll forgive me, I don't feel like bringing up the first son of the Kim family, who is as spoiled and capricious as a woman. Kim Tech raised his hand and pointed his finger at him, but Ji Sub was moving back and forth, which was odd as he remained seated, so he was forced to move his finger and follow him. Ji Sub, I am not in the mood, but if you provoke me a little more I may save your father the trouble of getting you into the royal guard, for I am capable of separating your head from your body with my sword. Ji Sub looked up and, with disdain, turned his attention back to the most important thing, the empty alcohol bowl in front of him. Seeing that his former friend was not listening to him, Kim Tech blinked a couple of times with an outstretched finger and, with the same, sat back down noisily. He rubbed his face once more to concentrate on what really mattered, how to save his beloved. He had two options, show up at the celebration and shout at the top of his lungs that the woman belonged to him, or sneak into the old man's house at night and bring forward the time of death with the blade of his sword. The second was more attractive to him. Of all the men who could appear in front of him, it had to be Kim Turk. Ji Sub had to go to the wedding of his beloved. He felt terribly stupid to imagine that she, the most beautiful of all women, could marry him. He almost understood her, between a man who could be the head of the royal guard and a man who lived in the royal palace as the king's minister, the choice was clear, but it hurt his eyes to think that he would never see her silky white skin again, that her eyes would never smile at him again as they played at loving each other, at hiding in their clandestine trysts. Understanding or wanting to understand didn't help to soothe the pain of heartbreak. Never again would his heart be as full as when their bodies and breaths were one, making him feel the chosen of the gods, nor as dead as in that moment when he lost her forever. He was drinking, he couldn't remember how long he had sat there ordering bottle after bottle, licking his wounds for the loss of his love. Like the great warrior he wasn't wanted to be, his face showed none of the emotions that danced between his heart and his stomach, a funereal dance from which he did not know if he could or would ever recover. Nevertheless, the squinting of his eyes made it clear to those who looked at him what his state was. He wondered if he could ever trust a woman again, when the one who had whispered words of love to him while they loved each other was preparing to marry. He imagined her half-moon eyes, her perfect face, her voice melodious as a riverbed in spring, and his heart began to feel the cold of an eternal winter, the loneliness of an untimely death. He was concentrating on his own suffering, but Kim Tech kept nagging at him, making his ears prick up, and so his thoughts dissolved in his mind like sugar in water. He would have made a good comrade in arms, but he was a first son, and he would be a minister above his station, ordering him about despite an immaturity that even age had failed to temper. He was like that, standing out in laughter above the others, and now that he seemed to be suffering, he did so outrageously, preventing him from suffering with dignity. He scolded him to shut up, even threatened to beat him up, which at the time seemed like one of the best ideas he had had in the last few hours. He looked around when he saw Kim Tech pointing behind him and to his sides, he sat up with the intention of at least fighting, but his knees buckled and he sat down again. He reached for his sword to lean on, but he had forgotten that to avoid losing it he had placed it on the table, it rested on the empty bottles that had been piling up there. Sit down here, he pointed to the chair in front of him, and stop wagging your finger looking for ghosts that only you see. Today is the day of my death, so instead of fighting, let's drink, said Kim Tech. He would have preferred to fight, but perhaps his foolish enemy would find his sword for him. I never thought I'd see you drunk, he mumbled, pointing to Ji Sub's right, and Ji Sub looked in the direction of the finger. Kim Tech's finger was moving like a compass needle. Instead of focusing on his eyesight, which was causing him serious vision problems, he concentrated on his finger. With his other hand he tried to grasp the wrist where the finger swung like a dowsing rod. Ji Sub watched him with an indifferent gesture, but felt the chill of the imaginary ghosts pointed out by his drinking companion. He would never recognize such a thing, but the only thing he was afraid of in this life was ghosts, people who leave the body forgotten while clinging to a time and place that is not theirs. He hated ghosts almost as much as he despised the first son of the Kim family, though on that day of mourning, even ghosts seemed like good company. When he realized he was drunk, he began to follow the direction of the finger with his eyes, squinting more than once as the bottles of alcohol began to arrive at Tech's command. It was going to be a day to remember, the woman he loved was getting married in a few hours and his greatest enemy was drinking with him. 
he drank from the bottle in the hope of forgetting, yet the sadness came back to him, tomorrow he might not remember that he was drinking at his worst with Kim Tech, but when he woke up, his wife would belong to someone else. If you keep wagging that finger, I'll have no choice but to break it off. If you would stop moving I wouldn't have to move my finger. Do you want me to move? He sat up, trying to grab her pointing finger, but missed three times. Ha, ah, I've got it. Kim Tech blinked at him. Are you drunk? That's not my finger. Ji Sub looked at the finger in his hands, it belonged to his other hand. He looked at it carefully, trying to understand how this could have happened. You're a cheat. He drank again, at that moment alcohol seemed more necessary and vital than air. How did you manage to swap your finger for mine? Tech lifted the bowl of liquor to his lips, opened his mouth to taste the strong drink, but nothing went in. He carefully checked that he had spilled it on himself. He put the bowl back on the table, more annoyed than he thought. I don't know what the hell you're doing here, you should be at home, taking care of your sisters. You don't even know how to drink. I have to go and stop a wedding, said Ji Sub. His eyes became two slits. Everyone is at that wedding, I'll kill the groom and get my wife back. Tex stared at him. What a coincidence. I was getting ready to do just that, he bent down a little and whispered, I have to kill the groom, and it may cost me my life, though I don't care. I just have to think of the best way to do it. We can join forces. Another bottle. Shouted G Sub. But why would you help me get my wife back? Tech touched his hair, thinking. Why would I help you? I don't know, he said, surprised by his own words. If we make it, you can help me later. I will. A man in the shadows watched them drink. He had a mask covering his face that simulated eternal demons, a frightening laugh, and eyes laughing wickedly over prominent cheekbones, painted red as blood. We are the king's best warriors, we can take them both out in the same night, said Tech. He filled his bowl again, pouring out half of the white liquid, and as slowly as he could, he brought it to his lips to try to get his wish fulfilled, the liquor down his throat. I am the king's best warrior, you don't even know where your mouth is. From shadow to shadow, the masked man moved closer until he could hear as clearly as if he were at the table the conversation of the drunken gentleman. He had to be attentive, he could not allow his mistress to be harmed by these two. His mission was clear and he would not hesitate in the slightest to carry it out. Fulfilling his mistress's wishes was at the same time fulfilling his own, a great fortune awaited him, he would leave that place and settle as a merchant in some important port. But in order to do so he would have to do his duty, the best swords in the kingdom were not capable of holding a bowl of alcohol, let alone a weapon. Kim Tech looked up defiantly and pointed his finger at him again, oblivious to the danger that lay in wait, surely no one would ever, ever dare to harm a minister's son. Don't provoke me, G-Sub, I defeated you in the past, I can do the same now, without a sword or anything. He lowered his finger and after further thought, added. But better after we finish the bottle. Let's drop this matter, said G-Sub, getting up and taking Kim Tech by the arm, let's go and kill the groom. At the wedding you can continue drinking when I leave with my Yang Di. Tech let himself go, both of them staggering back and forth, dragging whatever was in front of them with them. He was so drunk he had heard his beloved's name on G Sub's lips. He frowned, he might be drunk, but he could swear his ears were working perfectly. Who is the woman who has stolen your heart and your mind? Then we will go after your wife and kill the cursed bride and groom, but first we have to get my beloved, she is expecting my child and I don't want it to be born with another name. If I don't get it, I want to be cursed and live until my true name is on my child. Let's go to the palace, quickly. Tech let go of his arm, not without difficulty, causing both men to stagger from the momentum and nearly land on their buttocks on the dirty wooden floor of the inn. A son? I'm expecting a son, you can't expect a son, what's going on here? Are you making fun of me? He picked up the bottle of liquor next to him and took a swig, then passed it to G-Sub. The owner of the bottle tried to protest, but they both looked at him with unfriendly faces, so the man shrugged his shoulders and asked for another bottle. You know, that which tricked me. Yeah, me. And he thumped his chest. The son of the minister of Kim's house, she told me she loved me, the bitch, she tricked me with her goddess body. He squinted at the memory, 
and now she's telling me she's going to marry that wrinkled old man, that she won't be able to give him pleasure, and she'll crumple up next to him, do you understand? She's going to leave me for that conceited lout. And all for following the bloodline, that's her excuse and her miserable reason. G Sub found his sword and pointed it at his adversary's chest, despite being in a state of utter confusion, a thread of understanding was working its way through his stormy mind. Are you saying that Yang Di is your wife and is expecting your child? Kim Tech, seeing his drinking companion, a former enemy, wield his weapon, instinctively drew his own, but due to the obfuscation of the drink he could not find it. Wait, I can't find my gun, he asked, putting his hand in front of both of them. He rummaged through his clothes again and again, until he realized that he had it strapped to his back. He picked it up with deep joy and showed it to Ji Sub. Look, see, he did have it, a man shouldn't walk around without his sword. This was my grandfather's, passed down from generation to generation, look, it's got the family crest and everything. He showed him the hilt. My father claims it's stained with the blood of a thousand enemies. I think he exaggerates, but I'll let him do it, he's an old man. Instantly, his face changed from joy to anger in an instant. He added, Yang Di is your wife? Are you telling me that this delicate spring flower, this sly bitch with white skin and red lips lured me with her beautiful body and then cheated on me with you? You're lying. Ji Sub leaned on his weapon as if it were a crutch, and waited patiently for his opponent to be ready. He was startled when he found himself with the tip of the sword near his nose and took a step back. Swaying his body, which seemed to seek the ground, he was able to drive the sword into the ground and clung to it, as a castaway in the middle of the sea clings to a piece of wood. He put a finger to his ear, shook it as if he could not hear well, sighed, all his emotions and thoughts passed over his face one by one. The frown of thinking that his wife had been with a man like Kim Tech, the sorrow in his heart at feeling that his life would end with a double betrayal by the woman he loved, the rage of knowing himself to be an easily deceived fool. He looked at Kim Tech, but Kim Tech, as always, looked almost smiling despite the sadness in his eyes. The drink had made him look a little fuzzy around the edges, so he opened his slitted eyes as wide as he could, and said, solemnly. First, let's kill the groom, then we'll kill ourselves. And whoever survives, let him kill Yang Di when he has had my son. Tech pondered for a moment, took the bottle from the table beside him and drank eagerly, then passed it to Ji Sub. The owner of the bottle simply raised his hand to ask for another. Tech wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and lowered his sword. That's a good idea, let's get that stinking old man, and whoever survives, let him take her life after she's had my child. My son, Ji Sub emphasized. I've got it longer, so I got there before you. Who says so? That bitch? There's no need for her to tell me, Kim Turk said smugly, if she had told me, I would have killed you sooner. Let's see who has the longest, G Sub challenged him. The two men embraced and, with determination, headed for the exit, thinking that they would reach the groom's house safely and kill him there. They did not think their plan through, their heads were not big enough either. They staggered out of the inn, leaning on each other as they waved their swords and shouted and insulted both the woman they loved and the man who was destined to be her husband. I can't understand it, said Kim Tech, I can't imagine her marrying that old man. Not after she's tasted passion with me. My body is young, I am strong and handsome. Any lady would be happy to be my wife, even my mistress. But she used me and then threw me away. Besides, I've got a big one. I have a bigger one. The masked man was hiding in the shadows of the night. He noticed that at this hour there were few people on the streets, and those who did walk the streets paid no attention to a drunken couple who was stumbling along in each other's arms. However, he could not let them out of his sight. Her mistress had foreseen that one of them might cause trouble, and she could not allow that. She should see her dream fulfilled, whatever the cost. He was dressed completely in black, his walk was stealthy and his every move was thought out and meditated so as not to be seen. If those two wretches, drunk as they were, fell asleep in the middle of the street and woke up the next morning, their work would be done, once married, they could do nothing. But if they continued with the madness of attacking the groom, he would have to act. The orders were to stop the two of them from spoiling the wedding, though their plans were different. The two stopped after crossing the bridge that separated the village from the grounds of the wealthier families. 
No stranger dared to enter, for the guard came and went, keeping the place as safe as possible. Let's see your little thing, said Ji Sub. Kim Tech shrugged, saying. Anyway, I have to pee. He massaged his penis to get it to the right size. Ji Sub saw him and did the same. The two stood facing each other, but were unable to determine in the dark which was bigger, so they looked for a lantern, luckily the path to the palace was full of them, and they stood next to each other after having manipulated their genitals to make them grow. Tech placed his open palm on Ji Sub's fresh erection, which crumbled at the mere touch, causing the former to laugh. Ji Sub followed suit, but less gently took his enemy's penis in his hands, and it dwindled to nothing. When she touched it, it stayed big all the time, said Tech, trying to find an explanation. She makes small things look big, said Ji Sub, mockingly. I guess we both have it small. Now I've got over the urge to pee. Let's go kill with our swords, which are really big. Their drunken plans were complicated, perfect in their imaginations, though they had not yet reached the point of realizing that they could not even walk without holding each other. For Ji Sub, they had to find a way into the old man's house, which would not be unguarded, find his room and kill him. Then he would give Kim Tech a lesson and, hopefully, he would be the lucky one to take Yang Dai's life. The thought gave him courage. He would kill her, very slowly, with his own hands, first he would have to wait a little while, he tried to do the math on the pregnancy, but he only got a headache. He moved a little away from his opponent and sheathed the sword without difficulty, not so his companion in misfortune who could not find the scabbard and seemed to be scratching his back, fortunately, he did so without using his full strength or he would have been stabbed to death by his own hand and in the back, a rather stupid death, thought Ji Sub, so he decided to go to his aid. He stood in front of him, put his hands on Tex and, as he helped him with his sword, another one went through them at the same time. They were skewered. They looked at the sword that pierced them and was visible between them. They fell to the ground on their knees. I expected to die, but it wasn't your face I was planning to look at last, said Ji Sub with surprise. Tech could not believe his eyes, lucidity gripped him in his last moments of life. He looked at Ji Sub, who paled before him. Damn that woman! The blood ran down his chest, staining the floor and his knees. He watched, not without regret, as it mingled with that of his companion. If his father found out, he would have a fit, something as precious as his blood mixed with his enemies. G sub, it was that bitch, I don't want to die without making her pay. Fuck. I don't want to die without seeing my son's face. You won't stop complaining even if you die. The shadow approached them, the twisted image of the mask announcing that death was a certainty. No more longing. When we are dead, we will know whose child she is expecting, we will also know about you, and I promise to haunt you in hell, promised Turk. Death will not be able to deprive us of seeing and knowing, we will do our best to find out and take revenge. Perhaps in another life you may know who the father was, but now die with the certainty that the mother had you killed. The killer, whose face remained in shadow, gave them a kick that sent them tumbling sideways. Mortally wounded, they did not even try to let go. The mask of the red demon fell between them. Out of instinct not to die alone they both grabbed their hands, these remained on the edge of the sword. Blood began to flow from their wrists and the mask, like a ceremonial bowl, began to catch it. In the sky the lanterns began to float, the wedding had taken place, it was midnight. When the fifty-first lantern rose in the sky, they left this world. A coroner would have determined the time of death at 051. Chapter 2 The Meeting, 051 AM Visits At present South Korea had become fashionable, not only as one of the financial capitals of the world. It had even managed to overtake Japan. The big families that dominated the business world knew that their peace depended on vested interests with the United States, China, and Russia. They had to let them in so that any possibility of an attack on North Korea was not even an order of the day among the dominant countries. This decision brought more than 200,000 foreigners to Seoul, hardly noticeable among the 25 million people. The conditions were magnificent for these foreign employees, flats in Gangnam-gu, a fully robotized house with magazine-style decor, a $2,000 card for living expenses, a chauffeur-driven car, and a salary of $5,000 a month. For many European students who saw their countries closing their doors to them, Seoul became a great opportunity. 
Carp and Die was dedicated to the creation of increasingly intelligent mobile applications. One-third of the capital was held by a Russian-American consortium operating through Switzerland, 20% by a company based in Shanghai and the remaining 50% by the country's largest computer company, which was owned by the Park family. It had rented an entire building for its foreign workers, 300 flats located in the best area of Seoul, where it placed two employees per flat. Flat 501 had not managed to keep its tenants for more than a couple of days. They used to ask for a new one or for rent compensation to move out, the reason was that every night at 051 the inside of the flat was 10 degrees below zero and not even the underfloor heating was able to combat the intense cold. The electronics were going crazy, the coffee machine was making coffee, the lift was going up to the fifth floor, and you could hear throughout the flat, the lift is ready and waiting. For five years, the employees asked for the change over and over again. Finally, they decided to rent it outside the company for a derisory price and a deposit of barely a thousand dollars, even so, every few days, it was abandoned. When Desiree and Amanda decided to look for work in Seoul, they searched the internet for flights to Ichorn and flats within their budget. They would try for a year, during which time an architecture competition in which Amanda would participate would be decided. Desiree, a lover of dramas, K-pop and all things Asian, didn't think twice. They made a joint purse with their savings, and if they were frugal and didn't overspend, they could stay for at least 15 months. Desiree was a not very tall woman with brown, curly hair and large, round, green, speckled eyes that caught the eye. She was a computer expert with a small attempt at hacking, something that could get her into trouble if her hobby turned into something more serious. And Amanda, an architect by profession, was a tall woman with straight black hair as black as the night itself, brown eyes that didn't stand out too much, but possessed a mystical air that appealed. Both had studied Chinese, German and English since kindergarten, learning Korean didn't take long and they practiced continuously with each other while preparing the essentials for the trip. When Amanda found a flat in one of the best areas of Seoul for $200 a month and a bond of $1,000, she figured there was something wrong with the place, so when she signed the lease, in English and Korean, she added a clause to which the landlord suspiciously did not object. All expenses for repairs, as well as the works that are necessary in the house for its perfect habitability in accordance with the quality of the rest of the flats in the same building, will be paid by the lessor. The contract was signed, the flight confirmed, and they would arrive at each on airport at 20 hundred hours local time, where a driver would be waiting to take them to the flat and provide them with the keys and explanations. With mathematical precision, everything happened as planned. The chauffeur, who they recognized by his name on a sign, helped them with their luggage and, once they arrived at their destination, took them to reception where they were given laminated ID cards with their photograph on them. Afterwards, he accompanied them to the inner garden of the building, where tenants could walk and ride bicycles. There was a small international restaurant in the middle of the park, and while they dined, their companion continued to explain the areas they could enjoy as tenants of the building. There is a gym on the ground floor, and on the rooftop there is an indoor swimming pool. We have vehicles at the disposal of the employees, you can rent them with or without a chauffeur. We also have broadband, in the documentation I gave you are the keys, there is also a contact telephone number for any problems that may arise with the flat. They were too tired to ask or comment on anything else, so they ate their dinner listening to the explanations, looking forward to getting to the flat to sleep. The password to access the flat is 5,291,720, I will show you how to change it so you can do it immediately. The middle-aged man left for the lift with a resigned look on his face, wondering how long the two women would last in the flat. They changed the password and finally entered his house. All the timings were met. At 21.30 they were asleep in their new flat, after checking that the hot and cold water worked, that the appliances were state-of-the-art and could be controlled with the remote control on a panel in the kitchen. In the living room there was another panel from which they could turn the lights on and off, turn on the heating, call the lift and open and close the blinds on the terrace. It had about ten more buttons, but they were too tired to try to check what could be controlled with them. The flat had two bedrooms with a double bed in each and fitted wardrobes, a large kitchen that opened onto a living room with a large terrace from which they could see all the lights of Seoul's most important buildings. It was heaven on earth, they thought, but exhaustion prevented them from enjoying it at that moment. 
They pulled down the blind and with a simple nod each went to their room, the one they had chosen as soon as they entered, Amanda the one on the left from the bathroom, Desiree the one opposite. At 0.51 the appliances went haywire as they had done on other occasions. Amanda woke up half asleep. Her sleep, though usually deep, was too light when she was very tired, one of the many contradictions of her personality, he shivered with cold as he put his feet on the floor. Tiptoeing he made his way to the control panel in the lounge. There she saw some kind of samurai touching all the buttons, grinning stupidly as the voice of the lift sounded, saying it was ready and waiting. A chuckle made her turn back to the space occupied by the kitchen. There was another guy in a similar suit, touching the panel and seeming to enjoy making coffee, there were about five cups on the marble shelf. Game over, he said, slapping the fingers of the one manipulating the lounge panel. Be still, he shouted at the other. What's going on? Desiree asked from the doorway of the room, her brain slowly taking in the situation. Her partner had need a man who was on his knees in the genitals. When he went to the kitchen area, he discovered the other weirdo running around the island to avoid being caught by Amanda. Both were tall, their long hair was tied back in a ponytail that left some of it loose, and their hair, black and shiny, swayed as they ran. The other was still kneeling on the ground. His hair covered his face, so she couldn't see his face, but she noticed the one that wouldn't let Amanda catch him. His slanted eyes belonged to a laughing man, and his lips, full and round, held the promise of sweet kisses. Desiree couldn't help but be attracted to the stranger, but she instantly came to her senses. To stop Amanda's advance, the man threw a jar of ketchup at her. Despite her tiredness and the fact that there were two strangers in the house, she couldn't help but laugh at the sight of her friend as a zombie chasing what appeared to be a samurai at a slow pace. She woke up with a start. She went to the umbrella stand at the entrance and ambushed the man her friend was chasing by stopping him with the tip of an umbrella. Who the hell are you and why are you here? Desiree asked. What the hell are you? This flat is collect to two lunatics and that's why it's so cheap. Amanda questioned no one in particular. Amanda, don't talk to these strangers, we'd better call the police, said Desiree, pointing her umbrella at the man in front of her, who stood still as a statue and kept moving his eyes from one to the other. Let's settle it here and now, I don't want them to kick us out of this flat, I'd rather they left. You, he pointed to G-Sub, who was on his knees breathing deeply to control the pain in his genitals, do you live here? Desiree was still uneasy, but her friend couldn't see reason. It was not normal that just after arriving in a country as far away from her own as South Korea was from Spain, two strangers would enter her house with who knows what intentions. Mandy, look, they're very big, and they look crazy. Look at that one over there, the one with the messy hair, he pointed to Kim Tech, who stretched out and squinted at the presentation, he's got a bad look, we'd better call the police. Don't reason with them. I don't feel like dying as soon as I get here, he whimpered. Can't you speak formally? Kim Tech asked, moving to the side to avoid the tip of the umbrella. I am the first son of the Kim family, and, he frowned and crinkled his eyes until they formed barely a line on his face, why do you see me? Not only can they see us, they can also hit us, reasoned Ji Sub, who was still kneeling on the ground, but was no longer in pain and was looking around in amazement. Desiree blinked and looked at her friend more fascinated than frightened. Is it me, or did he ask why we see him? She kicked the ground like a child. I knew it. She shouted as she waved the umbrella in front of her. We couldn't have a normal life, could we? You morons, Mandy, we've run into the only morons possibly within a hundred kilometers of us, and they're in our house. He looked them up and down a little more. And they're hot. He said with pain and regret. Gee sub, I think these women are strange. Kim Tech, standing in front of the woman pointing the umbrella at him, couldn't help but think how strange they looked, and not because of their physique. They were clearly not Korean. They were not the first foreigners they had seen, but no one had ever, ever, in all the centuries of their torture, managed to see them. There was a woman listening to them. At first it was surprising. They spoke, she answered. They asked her for help to end the curse that forced them to appear every day at the same time and prevented them from continuing their journey to eternal rest, but the most the strange woman could tell them was to think about the reason why they might be cursed. What happened to you when you died? What were your words, your thoughts, 
or those of your killer? There you will have the answer. So they deduced that the main reason was none other than to find his offspring and finally give him his rightful name, because revenge was already far away. Yang Di, as well as his killer, had been dead for too long. They're soaking wet, they're so hot in those clothes, said Amanda as if they couldn't hear them, then pointed to G-Sub, who was the closest to her. Show me the contract. Contract. G-Sub stood up and took a step towards her, standing a little more than a head taller than her. Do you want to negotiate something with us? Kim Tech did not look away from the woman pointing the umbrella at him, but tried to pay attention to what his partner in misadventures was saying. Negotiate well, G-Sub, she's got a smart face. Kim Tech took advantage of the fact that his attacker was also looking at her friend, grabbed the umbrella with a lightning quick movement and threw it away, earning himself a kick in the knee that knocked him off balance, he was then pushed by Desiree. He cried out in pain and, as he doubled over, he gasped. How is it possible that it hurts? It shouldn't hurt, we shouldn't be hit, what the hell is going on? He asked, exasperated. Everyone ignored him. Well, this guy is smart, he knows I'm the smart one. I don't want to lose my patience, what the hell are they doing in the house, and why the hell are they deprogramming all the devices? Amanda, don't get too close, he's got long arms and he's not to be trusted, I'll take care of this crybaby, crybaby? He looked at G-Sub, perplexed, did you just call me a crybaby? You were a crybaby when you were alive, and you still are. Are you ghosts like us? He asked, now intrigued by his new flatmates. Tech jumped to his feet and berated his enemy. I'm not a crybaby, you're a softy. But before he could finish, he received another kick in the shin that made him jump in pain. He glared at his attacker with hatred, if you do that again, I'll tear your legs off, which? Ghosts? That's the most logical explanation, of course, muttered Amanda, who was more than tired of the circus that had been set up in her flat. She grabbed G-Sub by the ponytail at the nape of his neck and pushed him to the door, pulling him out onto the landing and slamming the door behind her. The stranger did nothing to free himself from the woman's grip. Desiree watched as her partner caught the first stranger and tried to imitate her, but when she tried to grab Kim Tech, he grabbed her by the wrist and stopped her a few inches away from him. Mandy, I think this one is resisting, he commented with some trepidation. Amanda to the rescue. She took a step back to regain her footing, and dropped to the ground, slipping straight-legged at Tech's knees, who couldn't help buckling, and in his fall dragged Desiree with him. Now, you will get out of here without causing trouble. She grabbed him by the hair to separate him from his friend, who was lying on the floor with no intention of moving from under the man's body. Now I understand why men of no status cut their hair, said G-Sub, who watched as his partner in Tangles was calmly cut down. Kim Tech saw his pride wounded. Never in all his long life, living and dead, had he been so degraded, and by a woman. This one held him by his ponytail, while the other lay motionless beneath his body. He revolted angrily. Let go of me, you crazy woman. We were here first, he shouted as he grabbed her wrist, trying to loosen his grip. How the hell did you get in? Amanda turned to G-Sub. I just walked in, he said, shrugging his shoulders. Then just go back outside, he ordered, starting to get angry. We don't want to go out, replied Kim Tech who stood in a compromising position with one woman under him and the other holding him by the hair, there are a lot of strange people out there. He looked at his opponent with interest. Amanda finally let her hair down. Didn't anyone ever tell you that you'll never get a husband with that temper? He protested, rubbing his head with relish. It's a bit sexist of you to think that a woman who can fend for herself can't get married, but I'm not going to engage in a feminist discussion with you right now will pay your share of the rent and you'll leave. Desiree, since you made coffee, bring it. Desiree was still under Tech's body, who seemed quite comfortable on his mattress and made no attempt to pull away. You better go, Amanda, I'm fine here, thank you, he finally replied. Kim Tech looked at her and couldn't help but smile mischievously. Do you think this is the best time to flirt? She sighed wearily, okay. Sit down, she ordered G-Sub, and you too stop fooling around. They're obviously not too dangerous. Amanda microwaved the coffees that Tech had prepared, to warm them up. 
Since she took it sweet, she poured three spoonfuls of sugar into each one, put them on a tray, and placed them on the low table in the living room, surrounded by an armchair and two white leather sofas, then sat down. Ji Sub did the same and sat down next to him. Let the air flow, my friend, she said, as she moved a little away from him. Desiree sighed graciously. With an eye gesture he motioned for the man to get up, and he obeyed without complaint. They don't look like bad people, although they dress a bit odd. I've seen clothes like that in dramas, they remind me of that one we saw last week, what was his name? Poi what? These are better looking, said Amanda. G Sub glanced sideways at her and almost smiled, but they're a bit of a moron. Let's see your contract, she asked again as Tech and Desiree sat down on the sofa opposite. We don't want to negotiate, we have no money and we can't work. Amanda and Desiree looked at each other for a few seconds, the former yawning helplessly, exhausted. In the morning, I'll call the landlord and ask him to lower the rent even more if we have to share. I have to sleep or I will die. Desiree looked at her partner for a few seconds. Go to bed, if you like, I can keep watch over these two a little longer. You can rest easy. We'll try not to make any noise, G Sub reported with complete sincerity. I'm going to sleep, said Amanda, you do what you want. I'm coming with you, said G Sub. Do you want to die? I'm already dead. Looks like you're not as smart as you think you are. She punched him in the stomach and he decided to nod and sit back down. I can't fight a woman, even if I'm more of a man than you, he said to Tech by way of excuse. Kim Tech burst out laughing unabashedly, while Desiree looked at him from landmark to landmark. I think I'd better go to bed, I can't think straight right now. We're not crazy, woman, just a little dead. We've been talking to each other alone for years. You could stay a little longer, G-Sub is so boring, she said, frowning at him. And we hate each other, she added. Well, I don't hate you, I'm just waiting for the moment to take revenge on you, G-Sub clarified. Wait. Suddenly, in that instant, he realized that they were no longer invisible to two humans, at least, Tech said, Tech, they might find our son. Are you gay? Amanda asked from the doorway, homosexuals, is that we are sexual men? Amanda couldn't help but smile at the look of pride on G-Subs and Tex faces. Homosexual, man who likes another man and they are a couple. Amanda and Desiree burst out laughing as the two samurai stood up, they were surprised, angry and terribly offended. Tech jumped over the couch, getting as far away from G-Sub as possible. What is this madwoman saying? He looked at his partner in horror. I don't think they'll help us, we'd better come up with another plan. How could I like someone like him? I've got a bigger one. So you're the husband and he's your wife? Amanda joked. That's not true, and you know it. Mine is bigger, but we were killed before you saw it. Let's get it out now that it's light. Tech approached with a firm step as he rummaged through his clothes in an attempt to pull out his member. No. Desiree shouted. Amanda, stop this, I don't feel like looking at penises at this hour. The two women were ignored, both dropped their trousers exposing their embarrassment. As in the past, they tried to liven things up with a few moves. Before they knew it, two penises of similar size and interesting girth were being compared. Neither of them paid any attention to Desiree's complaints, but the penises immediately declined as Amanda approached and began to look at them with interest. Well, they're no big deal, either of them, he said with a laugh. What are you looking at? said G-Sub, immediately pulling up his trousers. Tech looked at her with disdain. We're dead, woman, that may work against us, but when we were alive they were big and they worked well. Tech looked at G-Sub as if he had discovered a new world. You're right. They can see us, and touch us. They've been beating us and humiliating us for an hour and it's at this point that you realize they can see us. And to think that you would have become a prime minister of the king. I think it was better for the country that we were killed. Let's hear what they have to say, I find it interesting, said Desiree, sitting on the sofa and watching the scene as if she were watching a film, but when the men drew their swords ready to fight, she changed her mind. The whole time they say they're dead. They've taken off their things and now they're going to fight. I think we'd better call the cops, 
I can't sit still with these two morons hanging around, no matter how good they are. In response to Desiree's gaze and her comment, Tex's member twitched and grew inside his trousers. Tex smiled proudly and nudged his partner. Mine can work after death, look. Amanda's gaze stopped him in the act of pulling down his trousers again. Look, the whiny ghost likes you, said Amanda. Desiree leaned closer to her friend and whispered. I don't have a good feeling about this, I think we'd better ignore them and their penises. They're weird, and we're used to being approached by the weirdest guys in the world, but this is the last straw. Let's go to sleep, let's see if this is just a dream and tomorrow everything will be back to normal. I can't sleep with these two touching everything, I point to the door. Tomorrow we'll talk about it calmly, now, outside. We can't leave, G-Sub reported. Why not? He was going to point to the mask, but at the last second he thought those two harpies would be able to throw it away or burn it or do witchcraft on it. We will stay here without touching anything. Will you keep your penis in your trousers? I will. Tech looked at Desiree, and hesitated for a moment, before nodding. Desiree sighed noisily and looked at her childhood friend. She looked tired, had dark circles under her eyes and her eyes were closing, but she remained calm. Those two big men didn't scare her, so she chose to do the same. Very well, so be it. But if you try to enter my bedroom, I'll cut off that little thing you're so fond of. He went to the kitchen and picked up a knife, the biggest there was, and the next largest, and showed them to the two men, who turned pale, and with a firm step he went to Amanda. Here, this one for you, it's smaller, but you know how to fight, this one for me, if you come in, I'll cut it off. We've slept in hostels with weirder characters, and, really, I'm dead. I don't feel like calling the police, or fighting with them. Tomorrow we'll see how we solve the problem. Amanda took the knife and went to her room, Desiree did the same. When the doors to both bedrooms closed, the two gory ear warriors looked at each other. In all the time we have been in this state, everyone has felt us, but no one has ever seen us before. Let's think about how we can use this new circumstance to stop being ghosts. Once in her room, Desiree, having made sure to keep the door closed, lay down on the bed. Events were unfolding before her eyes. Two men, dressed in old-fashioned clothes of the kind you used to see in dramas, quality, yes, but old-fashioned, with long hair and a menacing air, strolled so calmly through her house, repeating over and over again that they were dead. He looked at the knife carefully, and the moonbeams bounced off the blade, giving the impression that he was caressing it. He put it under his pillow and sighed. They had come in search of adventure, of a new life far better than the one they were leaving behind. They had left home, family and friends, and now they were surrounded by madmen, she thought of Amanda. She was stronger than her, more sane, but also more reckless. They had to look out for each other. They were alone thousands of miles away. He picked up the knife and stood up. He opened the sliding door and peered outside. The two men sat facing each other. The one with his hair in a full ponytail had his face pressed into his hands, while the one she had attacked was rubbing his hands together nervously. They spoke in whispers, but when they heard her footsteps, they both turned to look at her. She showed them the knife, just in case, and slowly made her way towards her friend's room. She noticed the gaze of the two strangers fixed on her back, but she didn't hear them breathing. He closed the door behind him without looking at them and walked over to the bed. Mandy, do you sleep? I would like to. I'm staying here tonight, okay? Amanda moved slowly, leaving half the bed free. Do what you want, I'm very tired and I want to sleep. Relax. Take a rest. Tomorrow we'll see what we can do. Meanwhile, in the living room, Kim Tech and G-Sub, enemies for longer than they could remember, were joined in thought. They're weird. And foreign. Commented Kim Tech with the last image of the little woman showing her dagger. They are, but so far they are the only ones who have been able to see us. I know. Maybe they are able to help us find the peace of the dead? Let us wait, I am tired of this life. If they are the key to ending this curse, we cannot allow them to abandon us. No. We must make sure they don't leave until we can be on our way. For the moment, the best thing to do is to act naturally, try not to frighten them. We need to know what contract you are talking about in order to be able to give you an answer. 
Both men sighed, looking into each other's eyes with the only light of the moon's rays illuminating the room. That damned woman! May she have paid dearly for her treachery, and for our death, said Kim Turk. If we can, we must find out what happened to him. Maybe these foreigners can help us learn more about our past. Tech looked at him for a few seconds. I'll settle for an end to the curse. Another century at your side seems like an ordeal. Chapter 3 It was not a dream. Desiree opened her eyes and sighed. She had hoped that what had happened the night before had been a dream, apparently, she had no such luck. Her friend's legs, resting so placidly on her stomach, brought her back to reality. She was in Amanda's bed. She sat up carefully so as not to disturb her and sat down on the mattress. She rummaged under the pillow and found the knife she had hidden the night before. Her friends rested on the bedside table. He watched her sleep. Amanda was a strong and independent woman, life had taught her to be that way. She was neither pretty nor ugly, but attractive, and she had a knockout body that she hid under comfortable sports clothes. He smiled when he saw her in the summer pajamas he had given him. With little hearts and pretty decorations. As soon as Amanda saw it, she put her fingers in her mouth and pretended to try to vomit. Don't be like that, Mandy. It's very pretty. All Korean girls have one like it. I hate it. Desiree smiled in amusement. No one will see it, only me. It's for sleeping. Her friend looked at her with narrowed eyes. Apparently, you want to bring forward the day of your death. Now, sprawled across the bed, she rested with her mouth open. He couldn't help but laugh, which caused Amanda to wake up disoriented. What? What's going on? Nothing, go back to sleep. He sat up, rubbed his eyes and wiped the drool from his lips. Now I can't go back to sleep. But you must be tired from jet lag. What are you doing in my bed? They both opened their eyes and focused on the reality around them. Still a little sleepy, they opened the sliding door. Their arrival in the living room woke them with a start. The mess made Amanda turn pale and she couldn't bear to see things that way, while Desiree stood with her eyes wide open contemplating everything around her. It looks like there's been a war. You filthy pieces of shit. Amanda muttered, enraged. The fridge was open and the table was littered with leftover food and drink. Sleeping like two drunks on the sofas around the table were the two strangers. Amanda, with a gesture, told Desiree to prepare the coffee, she sat down in the armchair that presided over the table and took a deep breath, moved her body forward and hit both their faces at the same time with the palms of her hands. Meanwhile, her friend put the coffee pot on and closed the fridge and the other cupboards with their doors open. They woke up suddenly. The sun was streaming through the terrace, bathing the whole place in its light, they looked at Amanda and quickly sat up, then, hypnotized, raised their faces to the sun. What happened? G-Sub asked sleepily, looking around him, why are we still here? Why is it sunny? G-Sub, what the hell is happening to us? Kim Tech asked, suddenly pale. His companion, as surprised as he was, could only shrug his shoulders and turn his attention to the two women who remained in the same room with no sign of fear or concern. Later he would have to find an explanation for what was happening to them. In all the centuries they had been living like souls in pain, appearing every day at the same time in the house where that damned mask was hanging, they disappeared silently at dawn. Seeing the sun's rays streaming through the window and caressing his skin was comforting. He looked at Tek who, as always, showed everything he felt on his face. He looked like a child receiving a gift. Strangest of all, although they were dead, their bodies were corporeal again, and he began to experience purely physical sensations, such as hunger, thirst, pain or tiredness. But he could still feel the lightness of his spirit, and he was sure that he retained the power to pass through walls. He thought, without fear of being mistaken, that these two little women were the key and had something to do with everything that was happening to them. The two women could not help but observe the beauty of these men. They looked like two Greek gods, although the exact term would be, two Korean gods. I suppose you're planning to clean all this up, are you? Amanda's tone left no doubt as to the correct answer. We need to talk. Without touching, said G-Sub, staring at the woman. What would you like for breakfast? Desiree asked from the kitchen island. 
rice with black beans, and some vegetable side dishes. Last night was the first time we had eaten in many hundreds of years, Tak replied, smiling with his eyes and mouth. Coffee for everyone, Amanda said without a chance to reply. They drank their coffee in silence, they to avoid angering Mandy, they to combat the fatigue of jet lag. I'm going to take a hot shower, Amanda reported after taking the last sip of her sweetened coffee, when I get out, I want this mess, she pointed to the mess in the living room and kitchen, to go away. I'll help you, Desiree offered, willingly. Desi, really, you're hopeless when there's a handsome man around, she said, resigned. Yes, I'm quite handsome, said Tech with obvious pride and a total lack of humility. Are we your servants? G Sub asked suddenly, in the most terrified tone he had. He who stains, cleans. I'm going to the shower. Tech was completely fascinated by Desiree to the point that, in over four hundred years, she was the first woman who had touched his loins, and she was also incredibly sweet and beautiful. Amanda went straight to the bathroom behind the door between the bedrooms. He hesitated between taking a shower or getting into the incredible whirlpool bath, opting for the latter. He turned on the tap and while the bath was filling up, he amused himself at the sink, brushing his face and teeth. Then he used the toilet, hidden behind a glass partition, he had already used it the night before, but he thought he would try the jets of water and air, as a distraction, while he filled the bathtub. G Sub had stepped through the wall and was leaning with his arms folded, waiting for the woman to come out to set the record straight. They had been too shocked to react the night before, but he was not about to allow a foreign woman to order them around as if they were mere servants. Royal blood ran through her and tax veins. All the reproaches he had in mind were erased in a flash when he saw Amanda completely naked walking towards the bathtub. When she lifted her leg to get in, her crotch tingled. He felt like running like a child and pulling it out for Tech to see now which was the bigger one. For a few moments he stared at her in rapt attention, but realized that he was invading her privacy, which embarrassed him deeply, so he left the bathroom and, without a word, set about helping Kim Tech and Desiree with the cleanup. Never in a thousand years could I have imagined that beneath the woman's strange clothes there was an absolutely perfect body. Desiree watches Tech as he makes the effort to try to clean up. His friend had disappeared, so it was just the two of them. She realized that in the sunlight he was even more attractive than he had been last night. Tech was picking up the things that had been left lying around the living room, but his hands were clumsy and he dropped half of them as he tried to carry them to the counter. She noticed his expressions. He had no filter and his face showed everything he was thinking, it was easy to read. She was frustrated when she dropped things and smiled when she managed to carry them to the kitchen. As Kim Tech busied himself picking up, his mind kept going round and round. Something was changing, he could feel it. The feeling that things would be rushed, and the certainty that he might not be able to deal with them, worried him. It was daylight. She hadn't seen the sun in ages. It always faded at dawn, and feeling her skin being warmed by those bright rays filled her heart with joy, but also with regret. During the night, he and G-Sub had tried to come up with a plan, which was not easy because their enemy was closed-minded, even more brutish than Jun Pyo, who was capable of lashing out at anything in front of him when he was angry. He sighed as he remembered his other life, the life in which he was alive, the people he had known. They were all dead now. Why do you always say you're dead? Kim Tech snapped back to reality at the harmonious sound of Desiree's voice. He looked at her with a sly look on his face, unable to help but smile in her presence. He felt that this little girl was easing his burden just by looking at him. Because I am. Well, I don't think so, she replied, reaching over and touching his chest with one finger. See, your flesh and blood. Tech looked at her in surprise, for the last few centuries they had been nothing more than a couple of spectres floating around the house, unseen and unheard. He looked puzzled and then searched for G-Sub with his eyes. At that moment, G-Sub came out of the bathroom, confused and clueless, touched his forehead and rubbed his eyes in disbelief. Desiree saw it too, and blinked, surprised, sure that she had seen it come out from between the wall and the door frame. I'll help you clean up, he said, as he let his hair fall over his face so they couldn't read his expression. I hope you do better than your friend, he can't do anything right, he almost broke two cups, replied Desiree, suspicious, 
thinking that her brain was probably playing tricks on her. We men don't usually do this sort of thing, but we'll try, G sub explained, fiddling with the buttons on the entrance panel, calling the lift and turning the lights on and off. Desiree looked at him in bewilderment. The man fiddled with everything as if his life depended on it, and watched in amazement every time a light went on or off. What do you hope to achieve by playing with the buttons? I heard that the house did everything from these buttons, G sub replied thoughtfully, still pressing buttons. He turned his attention away from the panel and his eyes were caught by Amanda's body as she emerged from the bathroom wrapped in a small towel, exposing her legs and part of her breasts, another towel covered her head. Tech, like his friend, couldn't take his eyes off Amanda's half-naked body, looked at Desiree, who remained in the kitchen scrubbing the glasses, and imagined her in the same way. He couldn't help but get behind her and give her a little push with his hands behind her back. You should take a bath, too, he whispered in her ear, as excited as a child would be. Get off, don't touch me. When I finish cleaning up after you, I'll go to the shower, the girl replied, annoyed by the stranger's interruption. Go to the shower, I'll get dressed and get them cleaned up, and then they can shower, Amanda said, entering her room as calm and collected as if she were walking down the street in a smart suit. She put on her underwear and a Game of Thrones loungewear outfit. G. Sub had followed her unwillingly, drawn to her fragrance as flies would be to honey, unable to take his eyes off her and avoiding at all costs touching that silky smooth skin with his fingers. He came through the wall again, and this time Desiree had no hesitation, her mouth dropped to the floor and she sat on the couch, her legs trembling. I can't believe it, he commented as he rubbed his head, I think I'm seeing visions. Tech turned his attention from Amanda to Desiree, who was moving slowly around the room until she dropped onto the couch, as pale as if she'd seen a ghost. That made him smile, but instantly his face changed and concern flashed in his eyes. What's the matter, are you feeling sick? I think you should go and take a shower, it will do you good, he advised, kneeling in front of her, afraid to touch her. Has it gone through the wall? Has he gone through the wall? She murmured incessantly. Tech smiled more cheerfully. Does that surprise you? We do it all the time, I can do it too, look. And the man, so cool, walked through the wall of the room, glad to be able to prove to Desiree that he could match and surpass the skills of the fastidious G-sub, walked out of the room with equal joy and knelt down beside her. See? It's something we do naturally. If you like it, I can do it again. Are you going to the shower now? He asked anxiously. I couldn't wait to see this woman's legs in the sunlight. Amanda came out at that moment, saw Desiree as pale as dead and tech too close to her. What's going on here? He shouted, bordering on anger. G sub walked out of the room right behind Amanda, staying almost at her back. Distractedly he looked at tech, trying to make sense of the new situation and the tension that was beginning to weigh on the place. Haven't you seen it? cried Desiree, hysterically, they're coming through the wall. This must be a dream, pinch me, come on, do it. This can't be happening to us. Tech, anxious to score points against Desiree, pinched her unceremoniously, and she cried out in pain, giving him a sucker punch, which caused him to lose his balance and end up with his butt on the ground. Don't be silly, Amanda said, dismissing her friend's words, and let's pack up. I have to go out today to pick up the rules for the architectural competition for the old people's home. She turned and saw G. Sub looking at her dumbfounded, grabbed his arm and led him to the kitchen, turned on the tap, handed him a scouring pad and the bottle of detergent. Wash the dishes, then wipe the worktop. G. Sub obediently washed only the dishes, leaving the rest of the crockery in the sink, then, with the sleeve of his robe, began to wipe the worktop. Amanda approached Tech and handed him a tray. Put all the dishes on the tray and take them to the sink to be washed by your friend. What's wrong with you? She asked Desiree, whose legs were still shaking as if she were going to tap dance. Didn't I tell you they can walk through walls? Don't you believe me? Why are you so calm? They're all the time saying they're ghosts, they appear out of nowhere, and now. 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 They walk through walls. Who walks through walls? He asked patiently, sitting down next to her. Mandy, I swear, I'm not crazy, she implored as she grabbed his hands, I've seen you walk through walls, both of you. Look, you, 
she said pointing at Tech, do it again. Tech, who was putting things on the tray, looked at the two women and it was clear to him which order he would obey, so he carried the tray and dropped its contents into the sink, some of the pieces shattering with a clatter. Amanda put her hands to her head in resignation. What could be more useless? She tried to get up, but Desiree grabbed her sweatshirt and pulled her back to her seat. Wait and see. I think I'm going to faint, he said, almost hyperventilating. That's because of jet lag, I'm going to make you a coffee, if they do that they can put salt instead of sugar. Mandy, Desiree pleaded, if anything happens to me, we don't have social security here, she said suddenly, as if a light bulb had gone off. With what we've saved on the house budget, we have enough if anything should happen to you, besides, don't be ashy. I'll make your coffee, you just put your feet up. Amanda managed to get away from Desiree and made her way to the kitchen. The two men squared up in front of her as if they were in the army. Tech walked up to his enemy and whispered. This woman is scarier than your father. I like her better than Yang Di. She is perfect. He looked at her as if instead of having a woman with a bad gesture, he was in front of the divinity itself. Amanda stared at them. You, pick up what's broken and throw it here. He showed her the rubbish. You, wash everything, the plates, glasses and cutlery, and make sure they are clean. Then he went to the machine and prepared a coffee, which he took to Desiree. Tech blinked a couple of times and looked at his companion, as he obeyed without complaint, he imitated him. Desiree sat on the sofa, looking at her hands and thinking how beautiful the flowers were in spring. Amanda made her drink her coffee and settled her with some cushions under her feet. Do you want me to play you a Korean series? She asked sweetly. Amanda, do you know that the air in this country smells different from the air in Spain? Don't you feel it is more floral? What are you talking about now? Tech and G sub listened to them while still doing what Amanda had ordered them to do. Haven't you noticed? It smells like spring in our village, I think I like it, I don't want to leave here, he whined. Well, as I see you like it and want to stay, continue to make them clean up. Amanda went to her room and brought her laptop, which she placed on the dining table, and started surfing the internet without taking her eyes off the two men and Desiree, who looked like she had been smoking something. Desiree remained in this state of semi-lethargy for a few minutes, allowing her friend to concentrate on her work, but then she stood up, as if propelled by a spring, and approached Amanda. Gee, you scared me, she said when she saw her friend's face just inches from hers. What's wrong with you now? Look, he whispered, I know it sounds strange to you, but he went through the wall. Again with that? Desiree bit her lip and said determinedly. Come on, let's get this over with. One of you try to break through the wall, he ordered, knowing they wouldn't argue even if they broke their noses trying, he gave them his full attention. Desiree sat down on the floor at his feet and crossed her legs like the Indians. The two men looked at each other, but it was Tech who quickly wiped his hands and headed for the wall, which he passed through with ease. Desiree watched her friend carefully, her mouth now open and her eyes wide. Tech came out again with that tender smile of his and appeared in the living room. Amanda stood up, dropping the laptop, which Desiree caught on the fly. She opened and closed her mouth like a fish, trying to speak, but to no avail. G-Sub walked up to Tech and muttered through gritted teeth. What did we talk about last night about not scaring them? The man looked at him blankly. Didn't we agree that we needed them? Kim Tech extended an arm and pointed a finger at her. She asked for it, I haven't done anything wrong, nothing wrong. Look at her, she's pale. You're a cork oak who doesn't think about what he's doing. Tech turned, facing him. Wasn't it you who went through the wall first? I did no such thing. You are a liar. Liar? Yes, and stop repeating my words, you're giving me a headache. I seem to recall, Tack replied, his voice too low for his anger, that you were the first, going into the bathroom after Amanda like a lapdog, and you came out the same way. In the bathroom. Behind me. The person involved managed to say. The men continued to pay no heed. And then, like the idiot you are, you followed her into her room, blinded by her bare legs, and came out the same way. G-Sub thought it over, carefully. Is it possible that he did that? 
You can swear it is. In the bathroom. Behind me. Amanda shouted in desperation. The two men turned to look at her and, startled, Desiree almost dropped the laptop she was holding in her lap. Hum. G sub muttered, not knowing what to say. Have you seen me naked? The man blushed as he remembered the beauty of the naked female body. M. Well, maybe, just a little bit. Can you see a naked body just a little bit? Amanda asked Desiree. She just shrugged her shoulders, seriously, Mandy, out of everything that's happened, you're just worried that he saw you naked? You really are special. That's the least of our problems. Amanda turned and glared at G-Sub. This won't stay that way, we'll sort it out when everything else is cleared up. The man shrank back a little and whispered. It's a bit scary, but I love it. Tech grinned like an idiot at his friend's comment. Amanda sat back down and began to breathe slowly, trying to calm herself. She had to put her thoughts in order and find the logic in all this madness. She looked at her friend, who was still sitting at her feet and looking from side to side, more intrigued than frightened. Apparently, the first shock of surprise had passed and she was coping quite well. How is it that you can do that? He asked, looking them in the eye. We told you, we're dead, we're ghosts, replied Tech, who was now serious and looked like a formal man, although his disheveled hair and clothes were a little clashing. That is impossible. It is not, G-Sub replied, we are here to prove it. And how is it that you are here? Did you do something terrible and can't go on your way to heaven? We didn't do anything wrong, we were betrayed, both of us, that's why we're here, replied Tech, who approached them very slowly, until he managed to sit on the armchair facing them, his hands open in front of him, both G-Sub and I were killed in cold blood. And perhaps that is the reason we are unable to continue. Revenge? No, there is no one left to take revenge on, they all died centuries ago. So? We're not quite sure, you're the first people who can see us, but we sense that when you died something was left unresolved and we need to sort it out. And what is this something? We were both deceived by the same woman, she got pregnant and left us to marry her uncle. I think we must find our offspring and give them their rightful name, only then can we continue our journey to the afterlife. Fascinating, murmured Desiree. Bullshit. Amanda sputtered. This must be some kind of prank or hazing. But you've seen that they can walk through walls. And that would explain their hair and their clothes. Isn't it amazing? We're surrounded by ghosts. You never thought anything like this could happen to us. Amanda stood up and looked at her. You're as crazy as they are. I'm going, I've got things to do. Then we'll see how to deal with this.